Hi everyone. Um, this is the exam review for the final exam for uh, Psych 150. So um, what I'm going to do is go through each of the chapters in brief um, following the study guide um, and highlighting things that uh, students typically struggle with or um, that might be less obvious. So if I go quickly through some of the things, it doesn't mean that they're less important, um, just that um, some things lend themselves to review more than others. So. Um, so I'll try and keep it going in that way and, and get all the way through without uh, taking too much of your time. Um, and then after this is over, if you still have questions, make a note of questions that you have as you're watching it, um, things that you still aren't clear on. Um, go back to the book, look those up again. And if you still have questions, don't hesitate to um, email me or text me or um, get in touch with me in some way before the exam. Um, okay, starting with chapter one, uh, way back to the beginning of the semester. Um, so. Um, the first chapter is about the history of psychology and just some of the background information that you needed in order to understand things better. So at, at this point, at the end of the semester, going back and reviewing those things, you should say, oh yeah, we did a deeper dive on all of those and, and I understand them better and what their relevance is and how they differ from each other. So um, big names in psychology, um, Freud obviously is um, one that lots of people think of when they think of, um, you know, if they're trying to name all the psychologists they can name, Freud is usually one that, that comes to mind, um, although it's not certainly at the forefront or even in the field of research psychology at this point. Um, Watson and Skinner, both behaviorists. Um, so Freud, by the way, um, the psychodynamic approach, that idea that um, the unconscious um, is what is motivating us and, and influencing uh, the way we think and the things that we do. Um, Watson and Skinner, very much behaviorists. You are the product of your conditioning history, and if we knew everything about everything that ever happened to you, we'd be able to predict with accuracy how you would behave in any particular situation, including selecting your chair in a course or um, how you would react to a certain situation. Um, Rogers and Maslow, both humanists, uh, um, the idea that uh, you, people should strive to and want to strive to be the best that they can be um, and how to get there. So that's the, the humanist perspective. Um, and then um, there are a couple of others that don't come up in this chapter that came up later, um, Piaget and Erickson. And so we'll talk about those when we get to the chapter on lifespan development. Um, basic components of the theoretical perspectives, pretty much what I was just telling you when I was talking about those theories or those theorists, um, just review you know, how each area of psychology asks a different question, answers a different question about the same topic. So we could all be interested in people and how they behave in a situation where we want to persuade them for something, to do something, or how they behave um, in, in the workplace. Um, behaviorists would have one approach. Um, the psychodynamic approach would take a different view. Um, the develop, lifespan development or the cognitive uh, people would take a different view. So it isn't that these are competing theories. They are complementary theories that are looking at the same thing from a different angle. Um, so you can review those. Um, the difference between a theory and a hypothesis. Um, a theory is a statement of, uh, you know, based on information that's been gathered to date, how things work. Um, a hypothesis, though, is a specific testable statement. Um, I think if I do this, this will happen. And then you can go out and test it. And it's like, well, did that happen? And if so, your hypothesis was supported. You can now revise your theory, add another brick in the wall of your theory, and keep moving forward. Um, if your hypothesis was not supported, then you have to go back to the drawing board and say, uh, you know, my you know, what, what possible answer could we give to that question? Um, how could we ask it differently? Um, why did we get the answer that we got and not the answer that we were expecting? So a hypothesis is a testable statement, and it's formed not in the form of a question, but a statement of fact, and then you uh, either support it or don't support it. Um, positive and negative correlations, I think, are important because as you move through your careers and through life, um, you'll find uh, news articles that say, it turns out that this is related to this, that personality is related to how many apples you eat a day, or um, you know, uh, how well you do in school is related to how well the grass grew the year that you were born. Um, and the correlation is 0.7 or negative 0.7 or 0.3. Um, and being able to interpret those correlation coefficients in terms of the strength of the correlation. If you know the value of one, how much does that tell you about the value of the other one? A strong correlation, closer to one or negative one, um, if you know the value of one, you know quite a lot about the value of the other one. You don't know which one is causing it, um, but you do know that they are related. Um, if it's closer to zero, knowing the value of one tells you almost nothing about the value of the other one. So I think just being able to um, interpret those um, and understanding that just because two uh, 
two or more uh, variables are correlated doesn't tell us which one is causing the other. There may be some third variable that's causing all of them. Um, empirical evidence versus anecdotal evidence. Empirical evidence is scientifically gathered in a systematic way. Anecdotal evidence are personal stories. Um, and personal stories add up. You know, if you think that um, people like you are good students or good drivers or good employees, then every time you see somebody like you, you will notice um, all the things they do that confirm that, that, uh, that feeling. And every time you see somebody who's not like you, you will notice things that don't confirm that. So, but these are just all your personal stories. The only way that you can actually demonstrate that is to do a controlled study where you have an experimental group and a control group, and you do some systematic um, observations and then say, yes, we looked at a lot of people across a wide variety of situations and our hypothesis was supported or not supported. Um, so um, that's the difference between empirical evidence and anecdotal evidence. Anecdotes, those personal stories, it doesn't matter how many of them you have, they weren't gathered in a scientific way and so that doesn't help you to demonstrate that theory. Um, components of a true experiment. Um, you have to have random assignment to groups. You have to have a control group and a comparison group um, and you have to randomly assign people. I cannot compare the performance in an 8 a.m. psych class to a 10 a.m. psych class and say, you know what, time of day matters. Because there are a lot of, you know, you weren't randomly assigned to an 8 a.m. class or a 10 a.m. class. And so there are a lot of other variables that would have influenced which time period you were taking the class in. Uh, and so the only way to really study that in a scientific way is to randomly assign people to groups. So that's why it's really important to do that. Um, uh, the role of biology and psychology. When you get to, um, to that chapter, I think at this point as a review and as a final exam exercise, I'm um, looking at some of the higher level things and not getting into the details in the way that we did when we were studying it um, in class and also when you were tested on it the first time. So do know the parts of the neuron so that if somebody's talking about the cell body or the axon or myelinization or those kinds of things that you know what they're talking about and what their function is so that you can understand the explanation um, and understand what the issue is if there's an issue. Um, how neurons communicate at synapses. This is that idea of electrochemical transmission. An electrical signal causes neurotransmitters to be released um, and then they travel across the synapse and they um, so at that point, it's a chemical. It was an electrical signal coming down. At that release point, it's a chemical signal. It goes across the synapse. Um, it goes into the receptors or not um, of the receiving neuron um, into their dendrites, um, and then the, the message goes on. So it's, it's partly electrical, partly chemical, and that's why we call it an electrochemical um, uh, transmission. Um, so neuron parts, um, those are in there. Neural networks, the idea that um, neurons fire together, neurons that fire together wire together. Um, and so um, neurons that, you know, that are required for you to have a conscious thought, like the one that you're having right now, um, that forms a neural network. Um, and so any, when any part of that uh, neural network is activated again, it may spread and activate the rest of that neural network. Um, and that's where if you can get a cue to something, like a memory that you're trying to remember, um, or a thing that you're trying to remember, a memory that you're trying to retrieve, if you can get a cue into that, then using spreading activation, you may be able to activate that neural network and retrieve that entire memory. Um, so just the basics of how neural networks work. Um, common neurotransmitters, um, I would focus on dopamine and serotonin. Those are the ones that come up the most in the news, but I think it's a good idea to have a base working knowledge of the five or six most common uh, neurotransmitters because there's ongoing research with respect to uh, dementia, with respect to brain development, um, acetylcholine, norepinephrine, um, serotonin, dopamine, and um, some others. So um, that's a good review for you. Um, that reuptake process, the idea that when neurotransmitters are released, um, some of them hit the receptors and some don't. And what happens to those extras? Some of they hang out in the synapse. Sometimes they are cleaned up um, by um, enzymes and then other times they are um, they are um, sucked back into the, um, to the uh, presynaptic neuron, um, into those uh, vesicles so that they can be used again. So the amount of neurotransmitter that's available in your brain depends on how much is hanging out in the synapse, you know, what that reuptake process is, how much is being released. Um, and that's where drugs that um, can influence dopamine and serotonin levels in your brain can influence brain function um, in, in uh, important ways. Um, okay, um, key uh, structures of the brain. Um, focus on things like the amygdala, um, the uh, 
uh, hippocampus, the hypothalamus, um, the things that were on that worksheet that you worked on in class, um, how those work, you know, not just the definition of what it is, but why you need that thing. Why do you need your cerebellum? Why do you need the pons? <clears throat> why do you need these things and what do they do while you're trying to do your activities of daily living? Um, chapter three, the chapter on consciousness. Um, you know, I, I think it's interesting that we still don't really know a lot about what how it is that the brain gives rise to this feeling of consciousness. You know, why aren't we just like um, a cephalopod? Why aren't, why do we think in the way that we do? What is the nature of consciousness? And that's the question that this chapter is trying to answer in a variety of ways, trying to highlight that uh, your, con your level of conscious awareness is somewhat of a mystery to scientists. Um, so circadian rhythms, that 24 hour cycle, um, I think it's important to know about those. REM sleep patterns, so I'm not gonna ask you about slow wave and, and uh, fast wave, you know, I'm not gonna talk about alpha waves and beta waves and delta waves. Um, but what I do think is important is the idea that REM sleep um, is very similar uh, in sleep wave pattern to being awake. Um, and so think about what that means. What does it mean to be dreaming and what are you doing when you're dreaming and why would you need a period um, throughout the night, why would you need successive periods that uh, would mimic almost awakeness and that would allow you to become awake if you needed to be getting close to conscious awareness but not quite getting there? Um, how is that adaptive in an evolutionary uh, in an evolutionary sense? Um, dream theories um, manifest in latent dream content is this from the psychodynamic approach, and the activation synthesis approach um, is the idea that as you are consolidating memories um, and, and consolidating information that's been encountered during the day, um, neurons are firing in your brain and moving things around while you're asleep. Um, but when you get up into REM sleep and you're almost awake, you become uh, minimally aware of all of these thoughts and facts and pictures and um, all kinds of things traveling around in your brain. And because when we get to chapter 12 on cognitive dissonance, we don't like to have amb ambiguity and we like to understand things. So your brain tries to make a good story um, out of all of these facts that are going on or moving around in your brain. Um, and that's where dreams come from. At least that's one of the theories about uh, where dreams come from. Uh, benefits of sleep. Um, there are different ideas about why we sleep. Um, and you would sort of think, well, why wouldn't you sleep? But, um, but it's an interesting question. Why do we sleep? Because we lose a lot of our um, productivity sleeping and so you know why is that and one theory is that it's restorative that it's a time when um, hormones and you know other bodily physiological processes can go on um, hormones can be released um, so that we can grow and um, we can fix things and we can also um, enhance things in a physiological sense so that's one theory um, circadian rhythm theory is the idea that um, that there were there are times when it's safest for us to be inside. We don't see well at night. Uh, we don't move as quickly as some other animals. So in an evolutionary adaptive sense, there can be an explanation for why um, as a l relatively large animal um, that, that uh, doesn't have some skills that you might need in the dark, that it might be more adaptive for us and, and it might enhance our survival if we, um, if we sleep at night when it's dark. And then the consolidation theory is the idea that it, your brain needs that time to consolidate information, to move things around, um, that you've learned a lot every day, you've experienced a lot every day, you've retrieved memories, you've then stored them again with additional information. So how does that all work? Um, and perhaps that's the time that is needed um, in order for your brain to do that. Um, in terms of sleep disorders, um, there are many of them. I think they're all um, fairly straightforward and you may have encountered them in the past. Um, in your own personal lives. Um, sleep apnea, I think, is one that um, is a uh, struggle for a lot of people. And so if you don't know somebody who has it, it's likely that you will at some point. So I think a little bit of background information on sleep apnea is helpful. Um, the chapter on development is a broad view of lifespan development. Um, I think um, for this chapter, for the introductory course, it's important to know um, the, the three prenatal periods, so the germinal period, the embryonic period, and the fetal period. And the reason that I think that's important is um, sometimes people don't know that they're pregnant uh, when they first become pregnant. And sometimes when things are going right or things are going wrong, um, you have a question. We don't usually have a question when things are going right, but when things are going wrong um, or have gone wrong, we look back and say what was happening at that period of development that might have influenced that so that we can learn from it and so that people don't do that in the future. So in the germinal period, those first um, 10 days or so, um, that's largely cell division. And so if something goes wrong during the germinal period, 
it's likely that the pregnancy would not survive um, because cell division wouldn't continue to happen and, and things wouldn't grow. <clears throat> In the embryonic period, that's the period of organogenesis, and that's when physical things are forming. The heart is forming, the lungs are forming, the liver is forming. And so if something goes wrong at that point and you have a malformation of a hand or an arm or a, or a heart, um, you can look back and say it was something during the embryonic period and we can actually date it, you don't need to do it for this course, but we can actually pinpoint it to weeks of development. During a certain week, um, hands are developing. During a certain week, the heart is developing. Um, and so we can go back and look at what was happening during that week, not to blame the victim, but to learn from it. For example, if there's a medication that was administered at that time, then you know that that medication definitely has an impact on the developing organism. The fetal period is a period of growth. Um, it's the longest period of the, of the pregnancy, um, and that's a period where there's a lot of brain development going on, and so things that go wrong during the fetal period um, influence the brain, influence cognition um, in important ways. Not that that's not important at other parts of the uh, in other parts of development, but it's particularly important important in the in the fetal um, in the fetal period. Okay, um, teratogens are anything that uh, that can influence um, the development of the organism. So timing matters, as I've just said. Dosage matters. Um, some teratogens have a threshold effect below which they don't seem to have any impact, but above which they do. Um, and so I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on that, but when you think about somebody who um, has one glass of wine, does that meet the threshold? Um, uh, smokes, but only smokes one time, or is exposed to secondhand smoke one time, does that meet the threshold? Um, these are things that are never recommended, um, but uh, just because you've been exposed to it once in a small dose doesn't, matter, doesn't necessarily mean that there will be a, a long-term impact, and in fact, for those two things, you probably, it probably wouldn't. Um, but dosage matters, timing matters, and the threshold matters. So that's important to keep in mind with teratogens. And not just for, uh, for recreational kinds of things, but also for prescription drugs, for exposure to toxins in the environment, for exposure to a virus, um, uh, you know, any, any number of things, stress. Um, attachment, I mean, in class we watched the video of Harry Harlow dealing with, um, with monkeys and trying to demonstrate that um, what what love is and, and what attachment is has to do with comfort more than with sustenance. So providing for the child is one thing, but um, providing comfort for the child is another thing. And so that was, it seems really obvious to us now, but it was an open question in the um, 50s and 60s and 70s, even in the 70s, um, when this experiment was going on and then uh, subsequent experiments were being conducted to identify what the, uh, what the important parts of uh, a close attachment or what we call a secure attachment um, are. Um, so um, number four on the study guide, um, attachment types, um, secure, insecure, ambivalent, insecure, avoidant. Um, so I would review those and see what the difference is. Keep in mind as you're reviewing those that um, when a child is separated from their parent in what we call a strange situation, they will always cry or we will always expect them to cry or almost always. It's that reunion behavior when the parent comes back then what happens? Are they glad to see the person? And so you can think about this in your own life. You could be really sad when somebody was gone. That doesn't say that you're not uh, securely attached to them. But when they come back, if you are angry at them, um, then that perhaps isn't the most secure attachment. That would be, if you're angry at them and yet you still want to be around them, that would be an ambivalent attachment. That would be the presence of both positive and negative emotions. Or if you just didn't want to see them at all and you just didn't even want to engage with them because you were, um, because you were so upset about it, um, that would be an avoidant um, attachment style. <clears throat> but the secure attachment style would be um, you know, being glad that the person was back and being comforted in that way. Um, theory of mind um, is something that children develop early in life. Um, very, very young children don't have theory of mind yet, and so they don't understand that you could not know something that they know. Um, they know that you know stuff that they don't know. Um, but if they know where they've hidden something, um, they will just blurt it out to you because, um, or if they're playing hide and seek with you, they will just blurt out, I'm hiding behind this door um, because it's inconceivable to them to know that they could be thinking one thing and then you could be thinking something completely different about the same thing. Um, so that's a, when children develop theory of mind, then they're able to keep a secret, then they're able to hide efficiently, then they're able to tell a lie. Um, and that's, uh, it, it's been an interesting area of research, the idea that 
um, children lying to their parents when they get when they're young um, is actually a sign of cognitive development. Now you don't want them to do it a lot or particularly efficiently and especially about important things, but um, but it does show that they're thinking in a qualitatively different way than they have been before. Um, Piaget's four stages of cognitive development. Yeah. I would review the um, the key developments in the sensory motor stage, pre-operational, concrete operational, and formal operational stage. And in order to remember those best, try to make examples in your own life, um, your own observations about what that looks like. Even if you don't have small children around you, you can remember what it was like to be a teenager. Um, you can remember what it was like to be um, in uh, fifth or sixth or seventh grade. Um, you can remember what it was like perhaps to be in third grade. So um, think about those things. And if you don't remember, go on YouTube and watch some kids um, because there are, there are lots of kids out there that, um, that you can observe. Um, egocentrism, centration, and object permanence, all definitions within Piaget's stages. Um, egocentrism, the inability to take somebody else's perspective. Um, so it's not like being an egotist. Um, children are egocentric. It's hard for them to take your perspective and understand what their actions looked like from your perspective, um, partly because they've never been in your position. Now, you and I can take the position of others because perhaps we've been in that position or we can imagine that. But for small children, that's a very difficult concept because it requires them to think their way and think somebody else's way at the same time. It's called dual representation. And it's a hard thing to it's a hard thing to hold in your mind all at once. Um, centration, we all do this at certain times. Um, centering on one aspect of a task and failing to notice all of the other things that might be there. Um, if you can think about a math word problem, sometimes it's difficult to know what to focus on and what to exclude. Um, and so children um, have to develop the the ability to decenter, um, to to stand back and say, you know. I, it might not, this might not be the most important thing. These other variables might be important as well. Um, and then object permanence, the idea that uh, things continue to exist when hidden. Um, with very, very young children, if you hide something, um, then they just look around because it's just gone to them. Um, and then you cover it, you uncover it and they're surprised and it's like it magically reappeared. And that's why they're so delighted with peekaboo uh, because they have not yet developed object permanence. Um, Kohlberg's Three Levels of Moral Reasoning, we spent a fair amount of time on this in class, so I'm not going to go over it again, but um, pre-conventional reasoning, when you think about how a five-year-old would reason, it's all about getting in trouble or getting a prize. Um, conventional moral reasoning is more, uh, you know, what will other people think of me? What will I think of myself? Um, what's the right thing to do in this situation? And post-conventional reasoning is sort of, uh, is more global. Uh, what are the uh, universal principles of how the world should work? Um, that are influenced or, or that could influence um, this decision. We rarely get to the post-conventional level in day-to-day -day life. Um, we can, um, but you know, post-conventional, um, you know, it would be um, not just what kind of a car should I drive and what kind of gas mileage should I get because I want to be, you know, a good citizen to my, um, you know, but then how is the whole world being impacted? And what if other people in the world took my point of view? And what if everybody took my point of view? What would the world be like? That would be post-conventional reasoning. Um, Erickson's eight stages um, are pretty straightforward. I will say that um, trust versus mistrust stands alone. The next three tend to clump together uh, and they're all about um, effort. Um, and if you're allowed to achieve in that way and to try to achieve in that way with a sense of, you develop a sense of autonomy and industry, you, you, you know, you have self-worth um, and self-efficacy. And if you, if you fail to negotiate those crises, um, then you develop um, self-doubt and shame and, um, you know, it's just, it's not a good thing. So what Erickson thought was at each stage of the lifespan, you have things that you should be working on at that age and stage. Um, you can still progress to the next one if you don't successfully resolve the one you're in, but you won't be working at your full potential. Um, for uh, uh, when you get into adolescence, it's identity, de the development of identity and, and how, how you know who you're going to be and what you want to be and uh, what kind of a person you want to be. Um, intimacy versus isolation in emerging adulthood. Uh, forming a close relationship. Do you want to live alone? Do you want to live with somebody else? Uh, what kind of a partner do you want to have if you want to have a partner? Um, and then in adulthood, um, the sense of generativity, um, giving back in some way, um, the idea that what you do matters, um, and then a sense of integrity in late life, um, looking at what your legacy is. So um, those are Erickson stages. Um, be able to identify those in order um, and just sort of the basics of, of what they're talking about. What does that mean? <clears throat> um, chapter five, sensation and perception. We spent almost all of our time on uh, perception. So know the difference between sensation and perception and then review some of the basic principles 
of um, optical illusions, for example. You know, why do we see things the way we see them and not always as they actually are? <clears throat> um, chapter six on learning. Um, remember what the definition of learning is. Uh, a relatively permanent change in behavior based on experience. Um, and that's different. It's not just, I learned something, you know, I learned, you know, how to put this puzzle together. It's a relatively permanent change in behavior based on my experiences. I learned, you know, to be a more careful driver um, because of the experiences that I had. Um, so the definition of learning is important. Um, review classical conditioning and operant conditioning and the components in there. Be able to identify in classical conditioning the unconditioned and conditioned stimulus and the unconditioned and conditioned response, remembering that the responses are usually pretty much the same. You're now eliciting a conditioned response, which is very much like the unconditioned response, but you've paired two things together, the, the unconditioned stimulus, the thing that happened naturally, and the conditioned stimulus, so that now when you present the conditioned stimulus, um, you get the conditioned response, or you get the response. Um, so review the terminology there um, and make sure that you're clear on that. Um, when you get to um, uh, the operant conditioning part, um, look at the schedules of reinforcement, fixed and variable um, schedules of reinforcement, and whether it's based on an interval and based on a ratio. Um, and also uh, reinforcement, positive and negative reinforcement are both good things because you should focus on center from the chapter four, center on the idea of reinforcement and not on the idea of negative and positive. Reinforcement is good. Um, negative reinforcement subtracts something and you feel good. Positive reinforcement adds something and you feel good. Um, and for punishment, punishment is always something that we find distasteful, otherwise it's not punishment. So um, if you're punishing a child and they don't hate it or they don't dislike it, then you're not really punishing them, right? You're kind of wasting your time. Um, but if you are punishing someone, you can either add something, and that's positive punishment, or you can take something away from them. Give me your iPad. That would be uh, negative punishment. You take something away that they want. Um, schedules of reinforcement we talked about. Um, uh, shaping, operant condition is all about shaping behavior. Um, we don't use um, you know, electrical currents and cattle prods um, to change people's behavior. What we do is we try and shape their behavior. We um, compliment them for things that we want them to do again and we scowl or, or complain about things that they've done because we don't want them to do it again. And those are small reinforcements and small punishments. Um, and the idea is that it will shape their behavior over time to the behavior that we're looking for. Um, observational learning, um, the uh, review the information on the Bandura Bobo doll study um, and what they learned about um, children observing adults behaving uh, with uh, novel aggressive acts and what they did. Um, and, how, and then think about how that relates to um, today's uh, video gaming technologies and uh, first person shooter games, for example, and what is the child learning from that? Um, and is it changing their behavior in some way? Um, chapter seven on memory, um, just review the sort of how we, you know, how memory works in coding, storage, and retrieval, and that can go wrong at any stage. And so when you say, I don't remember that, was it a failure of encoding? Was it a failure of storage or was it a failure of retrieval? Um, be able to identify those things. Um, sensory memory or working memory is very short. Uh, so, sorry, let me back up. Sensory, member, sensory memory is very short, you know, a portion of a second. Uh, being able to hear something, echoic memory, being able to feel a touch, um, and you can still feel it for just a second, but not for longer than that. Um, so sensory memory is very, very short. Working memory um, or short-term memory is what you're thinking about right now. Um, if somebody asks you, what's the capital of Kansas? You have to think about Kansas, think about states and capitals, think about whether you ever knew it, and try and retrieve that information. You, have been, you are now pulling things from long-term memory into your working memory. You still remember the question, you're looking for the answer, and you're working on all of that. That is your short-term or working memory. Long-term memory is what's available to you to pull from. What have you stored? What information do you have stored in your memory? And when we talk about memory capacity, we don't know that you ever forget anything. We do know that you lose the cues to retrieve something, um, but we're not clear on whether there is any um, upper limit on, on what you can remember because you can always remember one more thing, right? It's what the, the, you know, that 10 year old that says infinity plus one or infinity plus infinity or whatever it is that they say. Um, primacy and recency effects, um, and also the next in line effect. Um, primacy, um, you tend to remember the first thing in the list. Recency, you remember the thing that you heard most recently. 
Um, and then the next in line effect, um, when you know that you're the next person to speak, um, the person that you're least likely to remember the information from is the person that went right before you um, because your stress level is going up and you are preparing for your turn or your 15 minutes of fame. Um, and so you're not paying as much attention as you had been before um, uh, to the things that are coming before you. Um, chunking and um, being able to remember a social security number or a telephone number or some you know some long string of numbers um, the way to do that is to chunk it into uh, into pieces um, and it's not just numbers if you're trying to remember a long list of of kinds of rock for a geology class you might chunk them into types of rock and then learn all the igneous rocks and all the it's been a while since I took geology so all the other kinds of rocks um, go into different classes um, and then remember within those so that when you get use the cue of a type of rock you only have to remember the type of rock and then that cues you to remember the list that goes under that subtype um, elaborative and maintenance rehearsal elaborative rehearsal is making your own story for things it's a great way to learn new material, especially in a course like psychology, where you have a lot of examples available to you from your own life. Um, when you elaborate on what you're learning by adding your own story to it, as long as your story is correct and correctly reflects the thing that you're trying to learn, um, then um, that's a great way to remember things um, to apply to you, which is why in classes, I very often give people measures, um, take a personality test, um, take an intelligence test, take all of these things, not to diagnose you because these are just short classroom experiments. Um, and you know, it's not, uh, it's definitely not, you know, scientific in the sense that it's not, we don't have time to do a full battery of personality tests, but it gives you something to remember. It's like, oh, I remember what extroversion is because when I thought about it, when I took this test, it turned out that I was, high or low on this variable and here's what I thought about that. Um, shallow and deep processing, um, you know, when we try to focus on just the, the uh, outline of a word or how you pronounce a word, um, that would be relatively shallow processing. And um, when you're thinking about the meaning of the word or how you could use it in a sentence or a form of mental image of it, that's a, a deeper level of processing. So the more deeply you can process information, the more likely it is that you'll be able to recall that information both shortly after you've learned it and also on a long-term basis. A memory types, semantic memories, procedural memories, episodic memories. Um, semantic memories, um, memories of uh, stuff that you've learned, states and capitals, for example. Um, episodic memories, uh, memories of you know, your last vacation or your first experience driving a car or you know, something that was episodic that was, that was unique to you. Um, procedural memory it, are things like remembering how to walk, right? You don't have to consciously think about that. Um, hopping on a bike, if you ever have known how to ride a bike, it almost doesn't matter how long it's been since you rode a bike. Learning to ride that bike took a long time to get your balance to do all of those things, but then as an adult, you can have not ridden a bike for 15 years, hop on a bike and just ride straight away. That's drawing on procedural memory. Um, we have both implicit and explicit memories. Implicit memories are things that we remember but we're not aware of remembering them. Explicit memories are things that we could actually tell. Um, so a declarative memory, um, something that you could declare or say to somebody else is an explicit memory. Implicit memories are things that, um, like procedural memory, um, that are less, that are not something that we are consciously aware of, that we don't talk about, but we know how to do that thing. Um, State dependent and context dependent memory, you can review that in the book. Um, it talks about, um, you know, if, you're, if you've taken a class all semester long in one classroom, um, it's a really good idea to take the final exam in that same classroom because just looking around the room will cue you to certain things. Um, and that would be uh, reinstating the context. Reinstating the state, if you were um, under a lot of stress when you learned the thing, then perhaps reenacting that stress will help you to retrieve that information. Now, I don't know that, that that's a good example because I don't think that we would intentionally inflict stress or, or encourage somebody to feel stress. Um, but there's some other examples in the book that you can use. Um, prospective and retrospective memory. Prospective memory, remembering to do something in the future. Retrospective memory, uh, remembering uh, something that happened in the past. Um, anterograde and retrograde amnesia. Anterograde, not being able to form new memories. Retrograde, not being able to retrieve old memories. Um, flashbulb memories. Um, really important to remember that flashbulb memories feel super crisp, super, they feel like a photograph almost. Um, that idea that I remember exactly what I was doing when this important thing happened, this traumatic thing happened. I remember what I was wearing, who else was in the room, what the room looked like. Um, it feels very real because emotion is associated with the memory and it all comes back, flooding back together. It, it is no more accurate than any other 
similar kind of a memory and then source amnesia not being able to remember where you learned something who told you that thing did you read it did you experience it not being able to exactly place how you know the thing that you know okay so that's chapters one through seven I'm gonna stop here because I don't want videos to be too long and then pick up with the second half of the book in the next video so thanks